Are you interested in creating layers of interest in your garden? We're going to talk about texture, pattern, and rhythm coming up next. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now, in today's show, we're going to talk about an important design principle. That's texture, pattern, and rhythm. I group them all together. You'll see how that plays out a little later in the show. But these are very important design ideas, and they're illustrated here in this garden space. This is actually a dining room, if you will. I've put a picnic table down, some benches and chairs, and suddenly there's a place here to do outdoor entertaining. Now it's defined by a series of these wisteria trees. This is Wisteria floribunda, the Japanese wisteria. It has beautiful long racemes and an amethyst color. They flowered earlier this year, but now they make these lollipop canopies that are rhythmically placed all along this alley. And you can see that we have one, two, three, four of them on each side that create a rhythm. In between these, I've placed these shepherd's hooks and little tea lights. So in the evening, this is a magical place to sit out and dine outdoors. And when I'm not dining out here, I just accent this area very simply with a couple of large containers of lobelia. Aren't they beautiful? What a tremendous color of blue. Now another component of this space, of course, is the floor of this dining room, which is turf. So in today's show, we're gonna talk to a turf expert and learn how to keep our turf in tip-top shape. We're also going to visit an arborist who does some very, very creative things with some of the wood that he removes from trees. But first, let's check in the house and see how construction is moving along. Come on. What do you say, guys? How's it going? Oh man, you're all making some pretty awesome progress. What's going on here in the master bathroom is we're getting the tile laid, not only on the floor, but also on the walls. But let's focus on the floor for just a moment. What I love about this tile is it looks really old. And you can see the, the, the field of the floor is made of these little hexagons. And there's about 100 of these per square foot. And what's interesting is that these are porcelain tiles that are made by very few manufacturers in this country. And they're hand placed in a jig and then they're laid on top of this material which then allows the tile setter to place them. Now they also do interesting patterns. The border around the field is in this Greek key design. You can get a sense of it here, the black and white tiles making that classic classic Greek key and what could be more appropriate for a Greek Revival house. Now the floor is porcelain and it has a matte finish, but if you look at these subway tiles, these are actually ceramic and they have a glossy finish, which is really beautiful. So the design in here is very simple and very classic. Subway tile on the sides, like you would have seen in bathrooms in the 1920s and 30s. And then the floor, the same, would have been popular in the 1890s up until the 50s. And what's wonderful about it is that the pattern that we've created here really reflects the style of the house. You know, even large trees like this have their own wonderful texture and pattern and rhythm with the limbs as they arch out. I love this big old post oak. We call her the big sister. It's been important to me to take care of all of the big trees here on the property. That's why I often consult a certified arborist like Robbie Hudson. Robbie has another side to him that I think is very interesting. He takes the pieces that he finds from trees and makes very creative objects from them. In my line of work, you, you never want to have to go out and take a big mature oak tree down or some kind of big tree but you know the time comes when the oak tree has reached its peak and we have to take it down for the safety instead of hauling it to the dump or burning it. I'm able to recycle the wood and turn it into something that's more useful and some kind of decorative pieces for, uh, for other people. When I'm out cutting a tree down, I start seeing you know, some unique 
designs and, and rays of the wood. After I get the wood inside and you know decide which piece I'm gonna use, I'll go ahead and uh, cut it out to shape and then I'll, I'll put it on the wood lathe. It actually turns the piece of wood, and I have several different uh, wood tools that I use. As the wood's turning, I can sink the tool into the piece of wood, and so I can get the desired shape that I want. Then I, I can turn the, the piece of wood around and hollow out the inside of the wood. After I get the piece of wood on the lathe and I get it down to the shape that I want, I'll start to finish it with a sandpaper. I will put a, uh, a sander sealer on it, and that actually takes out any of the uh, sanding scratches that are left in the wood. I will actually seal it with a, uh, a food safe sealer. So if you want to go inside and eat a bowl of cereal out of it, it's food safe. Most of my pieces are, are designed to be put up on a mantle or to uh, put potpourri or something to show instead of actually usage. I'm able to salvage this piece of wood, turn it into you know, some kind of useful product, and then I have somebody else who really appreciates my work and takes it home and displays it on their mantle. And that alone makes the hobby worthwhile to me. You know, I have to say, there are few flowers as luxurious as a peony. Just look at these, aren't they magnificent? This variety of peony is a very old one. It was introduced in 1854, and it's called Festiva Maxima. It's considered an early blooming peony, and it is one of my favorites. And I just wish you could smell the aroma of these big, giant blooms. You know, there are lots of different colors of peonies. There are coral ones, I grow those as well. There are pinks and burgundy colored peonies. And I just think they're one of the most exuberant flowers you can grow. And I should say there are all kinds of bloom shapes as well. This one is a double, and you can see why they call it a double. Now, there are three reasons why peonies typically don't bloom. One reason is they're not sited in the right place. You see, if they begin to get too much shade, they just won't set buds and bloom. The other thing to think about is the soil. You want to make sure the soil is well drained. So here, we have complete full sun throughout the day, and the soil drains very well. I put a lot of humus in the soil when I planted these tubers. The second reason peonies don't typically bloom is they're planted too deeply. What you want to do is you want to make sure that the eye of the peony is only covered up so much. The further north you live, the more soil you will cover the top of the peony. The further south you live, you can put less soil over that eye. I planted these peonies in the fall because you can get the tubers, that's when they're dug, fresh in the fall. You could also pick up some tubers in the spring or you can find them growing in containers in nurseries. If it's growing in a container, you wanna make sure that the level of the soil in the pot matches the level of the soil in your garden and allow for any sort of settling that might occur once you begin to water it in. Another reason peonies may not bloom for you is that you've got to live in the right place. The deep south is not a great place for peonies. If you live in zone eight, I recommend trying peonies that are early season bloomers. Somehow the early season bloomers tend to do better than mid and late season bloomers. So what you'll find with these herbaceous peonies is that you can choose early, mid, and late season bloomers. A lot of people go, hey, I love peonies, they just don't bloom long enough. Well, if you live in an area where you can have early, mid, and late season bloomers, plant some of each so you can extend the bloom time for an entire month. They're such an exquisite flower. Now, you may ask, why do I have this ring of boxwood around here? I think it's a nice decorative element. And I placed it here with the antique bird bath in the center because in the summer, the peonies begin to look sort of tatty. I cut the bloom heads off of them. And then the foliage by late summer is looking really dark and it begins to die back. By early fall, it has died back and we just cut them off to the ground. And the boxwood serves throughout the summer months as a way to sort of hide the foliage that doesn't look that great. So the boxwood is decorative, but it also serves as a function to hide the foliage. Turf grasses and lawns out here at the Garden Home Retreat play an important role. They're like the carpet inside the house. 
if you make a parallel between some of the surfaces we have in the house to the surfaces we have outdoors, well, in the main rooms we have natural fiber carpets made out of sisal and core. We also have on the porches some indoor-outdoor fabrics that allow those woven rugs to stay outside. They're absolutely weatherproof. And then upstairs in the library, there's some traditional hand hooked rugs that are made in traditional patterns like the old log house pattern. Now look at this lawn. This is Zoysia Cavalier. It's a great grass for this area and you can see it has not had its first haircut yet, but it's time for it. And you can kind of see where the pieces of sod or turf were laid and it's knitted together nicely. We'll hit it with some fertilizer, give it a good cut, and just in a couple of weeks it'll be emerald green. Now, if you're the kind of person who loves your lawn, you're going to love Mike Richardson because he has spent his entire professional career troubleshooting turf grasses. One of the things that we come up against all the time is how to get uh, the information that we have to a consumer. One of the things that they find is that there's an entire shelf that maybe has 20, 30 different blends or mixes or types of grasses. Well, turf grass is probably as much as anything, you really do get what you pay for. One of the grasses is Kentucky 31 tall fescue. The grasses that surround it here are also tall fescue. So they're all the same species, uh, they're just different varieties. The first thing they think is that, well, I'll just buy the cheapest seed I can get because it's all the same. Well, what do you think you're going to get with this? Well, because of its light color that you see here, most people are going to probably want to fertilize this more to try to get it to look like their neighbors, which may look uh, like this one over here, which has a nice, a nice dark green, deep color to it. The other thing that this grass does is it grows about twice as fast as this one. So that means it's going to have to be mowed twice as often. The mowing quality is very poor on it, so you're never gonna really get, get it to look as nice as you might see with, with one of these grasses here. So again, you've got a grass here that is gonna require more mowing, it's gonna require more fertilization, and it's never going to perform uh, like some of these improved types that are out there. So it's very important when you go into a store and are looking to buy grass seed that you don't just go down to that lowest price point. You really do want to look at the labels, read the labels, try to determine, you know, what are the characteristics of the grasses that are in here. And generally, we recommend people to try to get to the higher end grass seed because that's where you're going to find usually the best varieties available. If the grass is installed properly and cared for properly, it'll last indefinitely. You should spend a little more money on the front end to make sure that you get good plant material, good genetics that will give you a great performing turf over a long period of time rather than just saving you a few pennies on the front end when you buy the grass seed. If you know me, you know I love to grow espaliered fruit trees in my vegetable garden. And when one of them didn't do so well, I had to make the decision that it was time for it to be removed. My friend Peter Tiveno drove up to the farm to help me replace my four-tier Cordon Gala apple tree and passed on some tips to help the new replacement thrive. All right, look at that. That's right in the middle. Right that in the middle. It looks pretty good, doesn't it? It looks great. You've got a great, a great wire support system here. Thanks, Peter that uh, when you plant this, you'll want to adjust the planting so that your branching mm -hmm. line, lines line with up the, with, with this support. branching here because mm -hmm. that's going to give you uh, uh, integrity in your shape. Plus, when it gets fruit on it, it's gonna support the weight. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, if you have a problem with ice mm -hmm. or, he or heavy winds, it's mm -hmm. gonna keep your branching secure. These gala apples last year were fantastic. They had so much fruit on them and I'm so glad that we went ahead and, and made this system and for that reason. The other is that I, I think that the branching structure is the most beautiful part of this whole exercise of espalier and I didn't want anything else to take away from it. You delivered my first trees to me, right. I guess was three or four years ago and I so appreciate you bringing a replacement. As you know, we had a casualty here. Yes, uh, I saw that. What would you do to the hole? I mean, obviously we had a tree here that died and I right. suspect it was w because of fungus. What, what would you suggest? I would dig out uh, a, lar a little lar an area that's a little bit larger yeah. than, than where the original tree was. Right. And then I would treat that with a good all-purpose fungicide. 
Is this a case where one, is there an organic preparation that could be poured in there like copper sulfate or Bordeaux? Really, copper is an exceptional fungicide and it's also a great way to control and avoid fire blight. Sure, because we certainly had our issues with that. We've all had it this year, <laughs> trust me. Well, now, so the trees planted, um, is there is there anything that I should do in the way of mulching these trees? Because in the past I haven't, Peter. I've overplanted them with herbs. This had chives on each side and thyme in the center. And when I took the the dead tree out, um, I took out all the thyme out. Do you see a problem with me using an underplanting such as strawberries or herbs or things like that that I've used here? I don't see any problem with that. The basic purpose of mulch is to retain moisture and to create shade, which is a deterrent to weeds growing. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go ahead and plant around the base of your plant, that's great. Now, the tying of these, I've used these little black pull ties. Right. Just to hold them, you use the green nursery ribbon. Do you have a preference? These types of ties are the nurseryman's tape. Well, that's similar to these little pull ties yeah. that I've used. The key to the tying of the branches to your support system has as much to do with not leaving what you have tied the branches to the support with. It's how long you leave them on there. Mm -hmm. The thing to do is every season or two is to come and check your trees and loosen them a bit because as the plant grows, that support needs to expand with it. We have tried to loosen ours a little bit and I think the older the tree gets, the more responsive you need to be, the more aware you need to be. As the tree gets older, you can begin to remove some of the ties that are closest to right, it. Right, because it's so strong bad. at that point. But I would never take the ties off that are near the end. You know, what I love about the espalier form, it's a real space saver. Modern gardeners, uh, their space is often limited. And so this allows you to have a fruit tree and a beautiful specimen, a focal point in a small garden. You can have an orchard in a space that is no taller than four feet tall and five feet wide and have all the apples or whatever it is that you want to eat. I have to say, I consider baskets an essential in the garden home. The multitude of shapes, sizes, weaves, colors, and styles make them handy to have around for a number of reasons. I have a lot of them, and I use them quite often. Since there are examples from every culture, there are baskets for virtually every decorating style, even the most formal. I find myself reaching for baskets regularly when integrating them into the garden home they can contain most of what I might suddenly decide to display in them, whether it's house plants, shrubs from the garden, or even cut flowers. Hey, I've got a surprise for you. We've got some new little friends for the garden hatching out today. Just two more have dried off. Just look at these little guys. A little baby chick, which is a Jersey giant. You can see it still has its little egg tooth there on the tip, and a tiny little apple yard duck. We've hatched, I don't know, probably about 50 or 60, and now I'm moving them over here and putting them in the brooder. Now, what I do is I put them in the incubator for 20 days for the chicks and on the 20th day move them over to the hatcher and they actually hatch in here. With the ducks, well it takes 28 days, so on the 27th day I move them over to the hatcher. And then once they're dry in the hatcher, we move them over here to the brooder. Another example of a mechanical hen and the brooder will keep them warm. And here I'm gonna put them in here with all their little buddies. You can see them just running around everywhere. We also hatch some little turkeys. So the ducks and the turkeys and the chickens are great to have around because they eat the grass, they provide fertilizer for the garden, and they eat lots of bugs. Now you've seen the adult birds around here. Down in the orchard we have the mobile chicken house, and there we have the big Jersey giants, those black chickens from the 1890s. Then we have the slate blue turkeys. Both the turkeys and the chickens are heritage breeds. And then we have those adorable little apple yard bantam ducks that run around the barn here. So as you can see, we've just added a whole new generation to the flock.
Now this is the part of the show where you send photographs to me. I take a look at them and offer some suggestions on how you might improve your landscape. Now in this case, we're in Colorado. Michael tells me that his house faces the west, so we know it gets a lot of sun in the afternoon. So why don't we take a look at assessing what he has and what we might do about that. This is very large and it feels like it's encroaching on these uh, blue spruce. Um, I can't quite tell what that is from the photograph. This looks rather large here and takes away from the front of the house. And then over here we have a place for storage that would be nice to screen this somehow if we could there. So by reducing this, perhaps bringing this down or legging it up, if you will, removing the limbs, I think we have some opportunities. Um, I also would probably think about the shape of this bed, which might come down like this and be a little more curvilinear. So let me throw out a few ideas. I think that we'll start with this side here. If we just planted just a few little dwarf blue spruce, just anything that would help break this up uh, visually where you um, don't just see the wall and you could actually keep things back there wouldn't be a big deal. A dwarf blue spruce would be nice, a dwarf Alberta spruce. And in front of it, you could actually put a small tree. Your property line probably comes down to here. You could do a small flowering cherry or something like that in this place. If you leg this up, um, this could be an opportunity for a Japanese maple, which would be a beautiful sort of burgundy color. It would pick up on the color of the house here bring the bed across. You could reduce the size of these, or you could plant mugo pine across here. Michael, those plants don't take a lot of water, and I know water is a big concern in Colorado. And you could bring that bed around like this, which I think would help immensely. Uh, and then against the foundation here, you could do bird nest spruce across here, just against the foundation. Then you have this evergreen form going. Then we could have some fun in this bed. You mentioned you'd like grasses. So you could come across here with uh, all grasses, all of one variety, something like um, Carl Forrester, um, a beautiful, beautiful grass. And then daylilies all along this area in a big group. And then you could finish it off with some colorful annuals here or even a lower grass, such as a dwarf penicetum grass on this side. You also have an opportunity, I've noticed here, um, on this end where you could echo some of the same things here to here using this giant spruce as a background. This, you know, what you'll see here is we've used the blue spruce here, I've suggested blue spruce here, and then you could underplant here and here with what we've done here with the daylilies, 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 more grasses and daylilies there. So it's a repeat across the house to help bring it all together. Michael, I hope that helps. <laughs>